Hello everyone, it's Mr. Nobody, and today I'm bringing you a great literature reading of Anne of Green Gables. I'm going to read the first three chapters. Chapter 1, Mrs. Rachel Lynde is surprised. Mrs. Rachel Lynde lived just where the Avonlea main road dipped down into a little hollow, fringed with alders and ladies' eardrops, and traversed by a brook that had had source away back in the woods of the old Cuthbert place. It was reputed to be an intricate headlong brook in its earlier course through those woods, with dark secrets of pool and cascade, but by the time it reached Lynde's hollow it was quiet, well-conducted little stream for not even a brook could run past Mrs. Rachel Lynde's store without due regard for decency and decorum. It probably was conscious that Mrs. Rachel was sitting at her window, keeping a sharp eye on everything that passed, from brooks and children up, and that if she noticed anything odd or out of place, she would never rest until she had ferreted out the whys and wherefores thereof. There are plenty of people in Avonlea and out of it who can attend closely to their neighbor's business by dint of neglecting their own, but Mrs. Rachel Lynde was one of those capable creatures who can manage their own concerns and those of other folks into the bargain. She was a notable housewife, her work was always done and well done. She ran the sewing circle, helped run the Sunday school, and was the strongest prop of the Church Aid Society and Foreign Missions Auxiliary. Yet with all this, Mrs. Rachel found abundant time to sit for hours at her kitchen window, knitting cotton warp quilts. She'd knitted 16 of them, as Avonlea housekeepers were wont to tell in odd voices, and keeping a sharp eye on the main road that crossed the hollow and wound up the steep red hill beyond. Since Avonlea occupied a little triangular peninsula jutting out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, with water on two sides of it, Anybody who went out of it or into it had to pass over that hill road, and so run the unseen gauntlet of Mrs. Rachel's all-seeing eye. She was sitting there one afternoon in early June. The sun was coming in at the window, warm and bright. The orchard on the slope below the house was in a bridal flush of pinky white bloom, hummed over by a myriad of bees. Thomas Lind, a meek little man whom Avonlea people called Rachel Lynde's husband, was sowing his late turnip seed on the hill field beyond the barn, and Matthew Cuthbert ought to have been sowing his on the big red brook field away over by Green Gables. Mrs. Rachel knew that he ought, because she had heard him tell Peter Morrison that evening before in William J. Blair's store over at Carmody that he meant to sow his turnip seed the next afternoon. Peter had asked him, of course, for Matthew Cuthbert had never been known to volunteer information about anything in his whole life. And yet here was Matthew Cuthbert, at half past three on the afternoon of a busy day, placidly driving over the hollow and up the hill. Moreover, he wore a white collar and his best suit of clothes, which was plain proof he was going out of Avonlea, and he had the buggy and the sorrel mare, which betokened that he was going considerable distance. Now, where was Matthew Cuthbert going, and why was he going there? Had it been any other man in Avonlea, Mrs. Rachel, deftly putting this and that together, might have given a pretty good guess as to both questions. But Matthew so rarely went from home that it must be something pressing and unusual which was taking him. He was the shyest man alive, and hated to have to go among strangers, or to any place where he might have to talk. Matthew, dressed up with a white collar and driving in a buggy, was something that didn't happen often. Mrs. Rachel, ponderous she might, could make nothing of it, and her afternoon's enjoyment was spoilt. I'll just step over to Green Gables after tea and find out from Marilla where he's gone and why, the worthy woman finally concluded. He doesn't generally go to town this time of year, and he never visits. If he'd run out of turnip seed, he wouldn't dress up and take the buggy to go for more. He wasn't driving fast enough to be going for the doctor. Yet something must have happened since last night to start him off. I'm clean puzzled, that's what, and I won't know a minute's peace of mind or conscience until I know what has taken Matthew Cuthbert out of Avonlea today. Accordingly, after tea, Mrs. Rachel set out. She had not far to go. The big, rambling, orchard-embowered house where the Cuthberts lived was a scarce quarter of a mile up the road from Lynn's Hollow. To be sure, the long lane made it a good deal further, Matthew Cuthbert's father, as shy and silent as a son after him, had got as far away as he possibly could from his fellow men without actually retreating into the woods when he founded his homestead. Green Gables was built at the furthest edge of his cleared land, and there it was to this day, 
barely visible from the main road along which all the other Avonlea houses were so sociably situated. Mrs. Rachel Lynde did not call living in such a place living at all. It's just staying, that's what, she said as she stepped along the deep-rutted grassy lane bordered with wild rose bushes. It's no wonder Matthew and Marilla are both a little odd, living way back here by themselves. Trees aren't much company, though dear knows if they were, there'd be enough of them. I'd rather look at people. To be sure, they seem contented enough, but then I suppose they're used to it. Body can get used to anything, even to being hanged, as the Irishman said. With this, Mrs. Rachel stepped out of the lane into the backyard of Green Gables. Very green and neat and precise was that yard, set about on one side with great patriarchal willows, on the other side with prim Lombardies. Not a stray stick nor stone was to be seen, for Mrs. Rachel would have seen it if there had been. Privately, she was of the opinion that Marilla Cuthbert swept that yard over as often as she swept her house. One could have eaten a meal off the ground without overbrimming the proverbial peck of dirt. Mrs. Rachel rapped smartly at the kitchen door and stepped in when bidden to do so. The kitchen at Green Gables was a cheerful apartment, or would have been cheerful if it had not been so painfully clean as to give it something of the appearance of an unused parlor. Its windows looked east and west, though the west one, through the west one looking out on the backyard came a flood of mellow June sunlight. But the east one, once you got a glimpse of the bloom-white cherry trees in the left orchard and nodding slender birches down in the hollow by the brook, was greened over by a tangle of vines. Here sat Marilla Cuthbert, when she sat at all, always slightly distrustful of sunshine, which seemed to her too dancing and irresponsible a thing for a world which was meant to be taken seriously. And here she sat now, knitting, and the table behind her was laid for supper. Mrs. Rachel, before she had fairly closed the door, had taken mental note of everything that was on the table. There were three plates laid, so that Marilla must be expecting someone home with Matthew to tea. But the dishes were everyday dishes, and there were only crab apple preserves and one kind of cake, so the expected company could not be any particular company. Yet what of Matthew's white collar and the sorrel mare? Mrs. Rachel was getting fairly dizzy with this unusual mystery about quiet, unmysterious green gables. Good evening, Rachel, Marilla said briskly. It's a real fine evening, isn't it? Won't you sit down? How are all your folks? Something that, for lack of any other name, might be called friendship, existed and always had existed between Marilla Cuthbert and Mrs. Rachel, in spite of, or perhaps because of, their dissimilarity. Marilla was a tall, thin woman with angles and without curves. Her dark hair showed some gray streaks and was always twisted up in a hard little knot behind with two wire hairpins stuck aggressively through it. She looked like a woman of narrow experience and rigid conscience, which she was, but there was a saving something about her mouth, mouth which, if it had ever been so slightly developed, might have been considered indicative of a sense of humor. We're all pretty well, said Mrs. Rachel. I was kind of afraid you weren't, though, when I saw Matthew starting off today. I thought maybe he was going to the doctor's. Marilla's lips twitched understandingly. She had expected Mrs. Rachel up. She had known that the sight of Matthew jaunting off so unaccountably would be too much for her neighbor's curiosity. Oh, no, I'm quite well. Although I had a bad headache yesterday, she said. Matthew went to Bright River. We're getting a little boy from an orphan asylum in Nova Scotia, and he's coming on the train tonight. If Marilla had said that Matthew had gone to Bright River to meet a kangaroo from Australia, Mrs. Rachel could not have been more astonished. She was actually stricken dumb for five seconds. It was unsupposable that Marilla was making fun of her, but Mrs. Rachel was almost forced to suppose it. Are you in earnest, Marilla? she demanded when voice returned to her. Yes, of course, said Marilla, as if getting boys from orphan asylums in Nova Scotia was part of the usual spring work of any well-regulated Avonlea farm, instead of being an unheard-of innovation. Mrs. Rachel felt she'd received a severe mental jolt. She thought on exclamation points. A boy! Marilla and Matthew Cuthbert, of all people, adopting a boy from an orphan asylum! Well, the world was certainly turning upside down. She'd be surprised at nothing after this. Nothing! What on earth put such a notion into your head? She demanded disapprovingly. This had been done without her advice being asked, and must perforce be disapproved. Well, 
We've been thinking about it for some time, all winter, in fact, returned Marilla. Mrs. Alexander Spencer was up here one day before Christmas and said she was going to get a little girl from the asylum over in Hopetown in the spring. Her cousin lives there, and Mrs. Spencer's visitor knows all about it. So Matthew and I have talked it over off and on ever since. We thought we'd get a boy. Matthew's getting up in years, you know. He's 60, and he isn't as spry as he once was. His heart troubles him a good deal, and you know how desperate hard it is to get hired help. There's never anybody to be had but those stupid half-grown little French boys, and as soon as you do get one broke into your ways and taught something, he's up and off to the lobster canneries of the States. First, Matthew suggested getting a Barnarda boy, but I said no flat to that. They may be all right, I'm not saying they're not, but no London Street Arabs for me, I said. Give me a native-born, at least. There'll be a risk no matter who we get, but I'll feel easier in my mind and sleep sounder at nights if we get a born Canadian. So in the end, we decided to ask Mrs. Spencer to pick us out one when she went over to get her little girl. We heard last week she was going, so we sent her word by Richard Spencer's folks at Carmody to bring us a smart, likely boy of about ten or eleven. We decided that would be the best age, old enough to be of some use in doing chores right off, young enough to be trained up proper. We mean to give him a good home and schooling. We had a telegram from Mrs. Alexander Spencer today. The mailman brought it from the station, saying they were coming on the 5.30 train tonight. So Matthew went to Bright River to meet him. Mr. Spencer will drop him off there. Of course, she goes on to White Sands Station herself. Mrs. Rachel prided herself on always speaking her mind. She proceeded to speak it now, having adjusted her mental attitude to this amazing piece of news. Well, Marilla, I'll just tell you plain I think that what you're doing is a mighty foolish thing. A risky thing, that's what. You don't know what you're getting. You're bringing a strange child into your house and home, and you don't know a single thing about him, nor what his disposition is like, nor what parents he had, nor how he's likely to turn out. Why, well, it was only last week I read in the paper how a man and his wife up west of the island took a boy out of an orphan asylum, and he set fire to the house at night, set it on purpose, Marilla, and nearly burnt them to a crisp in their beds. And I know another case where an adopted boy used to suck the eggs. They couldn't break him of it. If you'd asked my advice in the matter, which you didn't, Marilla, I'd have said, for mercy's sake, not to think of such a thing, that's what. This job's comforting seemed neither to offend nor alarm Marilla. She knitted steadily on. I don't deny there's something in what you say, Rachel. I've had some qualms myself. But Matthew was terrible set on it. I could see that, so I gave in. It's seldom Matthew sets his mind on anything, that when he does, I always feel it's my duty to give in. And as for the risks, there's risks in pretty near everything a body does in this world. There's risks in people having children of their own, if it comes to that. They don't always turn out well. And then Nova Scotia's right close to the island. It isn't if we were getting him from England, the States. He can't be much different from ourselves. Well, I hope it turns out all right, said Mrs. Rachel in a tone that plainly indicated her doubts. Only don't say I didn't warn you if he burns green gables down or puts strychnine in the well. I heard of a case over in New Brunswick where an orphan asylum child did that, and the whole family died in fearful ignories, agonies. Only it was a girl in that instinct, instant. Well, we're not getting a girl, said Marilla, as if poisoning wells were a purely feminine accomplishment and not to be dreaded in the case of a boy. I'd never dream of taking a girl to bring up. I wonder at Mrs. Alexander Spencer for doing it. But there she wouldn't shrink from adopting a whole orphan asylum if she took it into her head. Mrs. Rachel would have liked to stay until Matthew came home with his imported orphan. But reflecting that it would be a good two hours at least before his arrival, she concluded to go up the road to Robert Bell's and tell them the news. It would certainly make a sensation second to none, and Mrs. Rachel dearly loved to make a sensation. So she took herself away, somewhat to Marilla's relief, for the latter felt her doubts and fears reviving under the influence of Mrs. Rachel's pessimism. "'Well, of all things that ever were, will be,' ejaculated Mrs. Rachel when she was safely out in the lane." It really does seem as if I must be dreaming. Well, I'm sorry for that poor young one, and no mistake. Matthew and Rilla don't know anything about children, and they'll expect him to be wiser and steadier than his own grandfather. If so, he's ever had a grandfather, which is doubtful. Seems uncanny to think of a child at Green Gables somehow. There's never been one there. Matthew and Marilla were grown up when the new house was built. If they ever were children, it's hard to believe when one looks at them. I wouldn't be in that orphan shoes for anything. My, but I pity him, that's what.
So said Mrs. Rachel to the wild rose bushes out of the fullness of her heart. But if she could have seen the child who was waited, pa waiting patiently at the Bright River Station at that very moment, her pity would have been still deeper and more profound. Chapter 2. Matthew Cuthbert is Surprised Matthew Cuthbert and the sorrel mare jogged comfortably over the eight miles to Bright River. It was a pretty road, running along behind, between snug farmsteads, with now and again a bit of balsamy firmwood, fir wood to drive through, or a hollow where wild plums hung out their filmy bloom. The air was sweet with the breath of many apple orchards, and the meadow sloped away in the distance to horizon mists of pearl and purple, while the little birds sang as if they were the one day of summer in all the year. Matthew enjoyed the drive after his own fashion, except during the moments when he met women and had to nod to them. For in Prince Edward Island, you're supposed to nod to all and sundry you meet on the road, whether you know them or not. Matthew dreaded all women except Ra Marilla and Mrs. Rachel. He had an uncomfortable feeling that the mysterious creatures were secretly laughing at him. He may have been quite right in thinking so, for he was an odd-looking personage with an ungainly figure and long iron-gray hair that touched his stooping shoulders and a full, soft brown beard which he had worn ever since he was twenty. In fact, he looked at twenty very much as he looked at sixty, lacking a little of the grayness. When he reached Bright River, there was no sign of any train. He thought he was too early, so he tied his horse in the yard of the small Bright River Hotel and went to the station house. The long platform was almost deserted, the only living creature in sight being a girl who was sitting on a pile of shingles at the extreme end. Matthew, barely noting that it was a girl, sidled past her as quickly as possible without looking at her. Had he looked, he could hardly have failed to notice the tense rigidity and expectation of her attitude and expression. She was sitting there waiting for something or somebody, and since sitting and waiting was the only thing to do just then, she sat and waited with all her might and main. Matthew encountered the station master locking up the ticket office preparatory to going home for supper and asked him if the 5.30 train would soon be long. 5.30 train's been in and gone half an hour ago, answered that brisk official. But there was a passenger dropped off for you. Little girl, she's sitting there on the shingles. I asked her to go into the ladies' waiting room, but she informed me gravely that she preferred to stay outside. There was more scope for imagination, she said. She's a case, I would say. I'm not expecting a girl, said Matthew blankly. It's a boy I come for. He should be here. Mrs. Alexander Spencer was to bring him over from Nova Scotia for me. The station master whistled. Guess there's been some mistake, he said. Mrs. Spencer came off the train with that girl and gave her into my charge. Said you and your sister were adopting her from an orphan asylum, and that you'd be along for her presently. That's all I know about it, and I haven't got any more orphans concealed hereabouts. I don't understand, said Matthew helplessly, wishing Marilla was at home to cope with the situation. Well, you'd better question the girl, said the station master carelessly. I dare say she'll be able to explain. She's got a tongue of her own, that's certain. Maybe they were out of the boys of the brand you wanted. He walked jauntily away, being hungry, and the unfortunate Matthew was left to do that which was harder for him than bearding a lion in its den. Walk up to a girl, a strange girl, an orphan girl, and demand of her why she wasn't a boy. Matthew groaned in spirit as he turned about and shuffled gently down the platform toward her. She had been watching him ever since he had passed her, and she had her eyes on him now. Matthew was not looking at her and would not have seen what she was really like if he had been, but an ordinary observer would have seen this. A child of about eleven, garbed in very short, very tight, very ugly dress of yellowish-gray wincey. She wore a faded brown sailor hat, and beneath the hat, extending down her back, were two braids of very thick, decidedly red hair. Her face was small, white, and thin, also much freckled. Her mouth was large, and so were her eyes, that looked green in some lights and moods, and gray in others. So far, the ordinary observer, an extraordinary observer, might have seen that the chin was very pointed and pronounced, that the big eyes were full of spirit and vivacity, that the mouth was sweet-lipped and expressive, that the forehead was broad and full. In short, our discerning extraordinary observer might have concluded that no commonplace soul inhabited the body of this stray woman-child, of whom shy Matthew Cuthbert was so ludicrously afraid. Matthew, however, 
was spared the ordeal of speaking first, for as soon as she concluded that he was coming up to her, she stood up, grasping with one thin brown hand the handle of a shabby old-fashioned carpet bag. The other she held out to him. I suppose you're Mr. Matthew Cuthbert of Green Gables, she said, in a particularly clear, sweet voice. I'm very glad to see you. I was beginning to be afraid you weren't coming for me, and I was imagining all of the things that might have happened to prevent you. I'd made up my mind that if you didn't come for me tonight, I'd go down the track to that big wild cherry tree at the bend and climb up into it to stay all night. I wouldn't be a bit afraid, and it'd be lovely to sleep in a wild cherry tree, all white with bloom in the moonshine, don't you think? You can imagine you were dwelling in marble halls, couldn't you? And I was quite sure you'd come for me in the morning if you didn't tonight. Matthew had taken the scrawny little hand awkwardly in his. Then and there he decided what to do. He could not tell this child with the glowing eyes that there had been a mistake. He would take her home and let Marilla do that. She couldn't be left at Bright River anyhow, no matter what mistake had been made, so all questions and explanations might as well be deferred until he was safely back at Green Gables. I'm sorry I was late, he said shyly. Come along, the horse is over in the yard. Give me your bag. I can carry it, the child responded cheerfully. It isn't heavy. I got all my worldly goods in it, but it isn't heavy. And if it isn't carried in just a certain way, the handle pulls out. So I better keep it, because I know the exact knack of it. It's an extremely old carpet bag. I'm very glad you've come, even if it would have been nice to sleep in a wild cherry tree. We've got to drive along peace, haven't we? Mrs. Spencer said it was eight miles. I'm glad, because I love driving. Oh, it seems so wonderful. I'm going to live with you and belong to you. I've never belonged to anybody. Not really. The asylum was the worst. I've only been in four months, but that was enough. I don't suppose you ever were an orphan in asylum, so you can't possibly understand what it's like. It's worse than anything you can imagine. Mrs. Spencer said it was wicked of me to talk like that, but I didn't mean to be wicked. It's easy to be wicked without knowing it, isn't it? They were good, you know, the asylum people. There's so little scope for the imagination in an asylum, only just in the other orphans. It was pretty interesting to imagine things about them, to imagine perhaps the girl that sat next to you was really the daughter of a belted earl who'd been stolen away from her parents in her infancy by a cruel nurse who died before she could fess. I used to lie awake at nights and imagine things like that, because I didn't have time in the day. I guess that's why I'm so thin. I am dreadful thin, ain't I? There isn't a pick on my bones. I do love to imagine I'm nice and plump, with dimples in my elbows. With this, Matthew's companion stopped talking, partly because she was out of breath and partly because they'd reached the buggy. Not another word did they say until they had left the village and were driving down a steep little hill, the road part of which had been cut so deeply into the soft soil that the banks, fringed with blooming wild cherry trees and slim white birches, were several feet above their heads. The child put out her hand and broke off a branch of wild plum that brushed against the side of the buggy. Isn't that beautiful? What did that tree leaning out from the bank, all white and lacy, make you think of? She asked. Well, now, I don't know, said Matthew. Why, a bride, of course, a bride all in white with a lovely misty veil. I've never seen one, but I can imagine what she would look like. I don't ever expect to be a bride myself. I'm so homely, nobody will ever want to marry me, unless it might be a foreign missionary. I suppose a foreign missionary might be very, mightn't be very particular. But I do hope that some day she'll have a white dress. That's my highest ideal of earthly bliss. I just love pretty clothes, and I've never had a pretty dress in my life that I can remember. But of course, it's all the more to look forward to, isn't it? And then I can imagine that I'm dressed gorgeously. This morning when I left the asylum, I felt so ashamed because I had to wear this horrid old wincy dress. All the orphans had to wear them, you know. A merchant in Hopeton last winter donated 300 yards of wincy to the asylum. Some people said it was because he couldn't sell it, but I'd rather to believe it was out of the kindness of his heart, wouldn't you? When we got on the train, I felt as if everybody must be looking at me and pitying me. But I just went to work and imagined that I had on the most beautiful pale blue silk dress, because when you are imagining, you might as well imagine something worthwhile, and a big hat all flowers and nodding plumes, and a gold watch and kid gloves and boots. I felt cheered up right away, and I enjoyed my trip to the island with all my might. I wasn't a bit sick coming over in the boat. Neither was Mrs. Spencer, although she generally is. She said she hadn't time to get sick watching to see that I didn't fall overboard. She said she never saw the beat of me for prowling around. 
But if it kept her from being seasick, it's a mercy I did prowl, isn't it? And I wanted to see everything that was to be seen on that boat because I didn't know whether I'd ever have another opportunity. Oh, there are a lot more cherry trees, all in bloom. This island is the bloomiest place. I just love it already. I'm so glad I'm going to live here. I've always heard Prince Edward Island was the prettiest place in the world, and I used to imagine that I was living here, but I never really expected I would. It's delightful when your imaginations come true, isn't it? But those red roads are funny. When we got into the train at Charlottetown and the red roads began to flash past, I asked Mrs. Spencer what made them red, and she said she didn't know and for pity's sake not to ask her any more questions. She said I must have asked her a thousand already. I suppose I had to, but how are you going to find out about things if you don't ask questions? And what does make the roads red? Well, I don't know, said Matthew. <clears throat> Well, that is one of the things to find out sometime. Isn't it splendid to think of all the things there are to find out about? It just makes me glad to be alive. It's such an interesting world. It wouldn't be half so interesting if we knew all about everything, would it? There'd be no scope for imagination then, would there? By my talking too much, people are always telling me I do. Would you rather I didn't talk? If you say so, I'll stop. I can stop when I make up my mind to it, although it's difficult. Matthew, much to his own surprise, was enjoying himself. Like most quiet folks, he liked talkative people when they were willing to do the talking themselves and did not expect him to keep hit up his end of it. But he'd never expected to enjoy the society of a little girl. Women were bad enough in all conscience, but little girls were worse. He detested the way they had of sidling past him timidly, with sidewise glances as if they expected him to gobble them up at a mouthful if they ventured to say a word. This was the Avonlea type of well-bred little girl. But this freckled witch was very different, and although he found it rather difficult for his slower intelligence to keep up with her brisk mental processes, he thought that he kind of liked her chatter. So he said, as shyly as usual, oh, You can talk as much as you like. I don't mind. I'm so glad. I know you and I are going to get along together fine. Such a relief to talk when one wants to and not be told that children should be seen and not heard. I've heard that said to me a million times if I have once, and people laugh at me because I use big words. But if you have big ideas, you have to be use big words to express them, haven't you? Well, now that seems reasonable, said Matthew. Mrs. Spencer said that my tongue should, must be hung in the middle, but it isn't. It's firmly fastened at one end. Mrs. Spencer said your place was named Green Gables. I asked her all about it, and she said there were trees all around it. I was gladder than ever. I just loved trees, and there weren't any at all about the asylum, except a few poor weeny teeny things out in front, like little whitewashed cagey things about them. They just looked like orphans themselves, those trees did. It used to make me want to cry to look at them. I used to say, oh, you poor little things, if you're out in the Great big woods with all the other trees around you and little mosses and june bells growing over your roots and a brook not far away and birds singing your branches you could grow, couldn't you? But you can't where you are. I know just exactly how you feel, little trees. I felt sorry to leave them behind this morning. You do get so attached to things like that, don't you? Is there a brook anywhere near Green Gables? I forgot to ask Mrs. Spencer that. Well, now, yes, there's one right below the house. Fancy! I've always been one of my dreams to live near the brook. Never expected I would, though. Dreams don't often come true, do they? Wouldn't it be nice if they did? But just now I feel pretty nearly perfectly happy. I can't feel exactly perfectly happy because, well, what color would you call this? She twitched one of her long, gl glossy braids over her thin shoulder and held it up before Matthew's eyes. Matthew was not used to deciding on the tints of ladies' tresses, but in this case there couldn't be much doubt. It's red, ain't it? he said. The girl let the braid drop back with a sigh that seemed to come from her very toes and to exhale forth all the sorrows of the ages. Yes, it's red, she said resignedly. Now you can see why I can't be perfectly happy. Nobody could be who had red hair. I don't mind the other things so much, the freckles and the green eyes and my skinniness. I can imagine them away. I can imagine I have a beautiful rose leaf complexion and lovely starry violet eyes. But I cannot imagine that red hair away. I do my best. I think to myself, now my hair is a glorious black, black as the raven's wing, but all the time I know it's just plain red and it breaks my heart. It'll be my lifelong sorrow. I read of a girl once in a novel who had a lifelong sorrow, but it wasn't red hair. Her hair was pure gold rippling back from her alabaster brow. What is an alabaster brow? I could never find out. Can you tell me? Well, now, I'm afraid I can't, said Matthew, who's getting a little dizzy.
He felt as he had once felt in his rash youth when another boy had enticed him onto a merry-go-round at a picnic. Well, whatever it was, it must have been something nice because she was divinely beautiful. Have you ever imagined what it must feel like to be divinely beautiful? Well, now I, I haven't, confessed Matthew ingenuously. I have, often. Which would you rather be if you had the choice? Divinely beautiful or dazzlingly clever or angelically good? Well, now I... I don't know exactly. Neither do I. I can never decide. But it doesn't make much difference, for it isn't likely I'll ever be either. I'm certain I'll never be angelically good. Mrs. Spencer says, Oh, Mr. Cuthbert! Oh, Mr. Cuthbert! Oh, Mr. Cuthbert! That was not what Mrs. Spencer had said. Neither had the child tumbled out of the buggy, nor had Matthew done anything astonishingly. They'd simply rounded a curve in the road and found themselves in the avenue. The avenue, so called by the New Bridge people, was a stretch of road four or five hundred yards long, completely arched over with huge, widespread apple trees, planted years ago by an eccentric old farmer. Overhead was one long canopy of snowy, fragrant bloom. Below the boughs, the air was full of purple twilight, and far ahead, a glimpse of painted sunset sky shone like a great rose window at the end of a cathedral aisle. Its beauty seemed to strike the child dumb. She leaned back in the buggy, her thin hands clasped before her, her face lifted rapturously to the white splendor above. Even when they had passed out and were driving down the long slope, slope to Newbridge, she never moved or spoke. Still with rapt face, she gazed far into the sunset west, with eyes that saw visions trooping splendidly across that glowing background. Through Newbridge, a bustling little village where dogs barked at them, and small boys hooted and curious faces peered from the windows they drove, still in silence. When three more miles had dropped away behind them, the child had not spoken. She could keep silence, it was evident, as energetically as she could talk. I guess you're feeling pretty tired and hungry, Matthew ventured at last, accounting for her long visitation of dumbness with the only reason he could think of. We haven't very far to go now, only another mile. She came out of her reverie with a deep sigh and looked at him with the dreamy gaze of a soul that had been wandering afar, star-led. Oh, Mr. Cuthbert, she whispered, that place we came through, that white place, what was it? Well, now you must mean the avenue, said Matthew after a few moments' profound reflection. It's a pretty kind of place. Pretty? Well, pretty doesn't seem the right word to use nor beautiful either. They don't go far enough. Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful. It's the first thing I ever saw that couldn't be improved upon by imagination. It just satisfied me here. She put one hand on her breast. It made a queer, funny ache, and it was a pleasant ache. Did you ever have an ache like that, Mr. Cuthbert? Well, now, just can't recollect I ever had. I've had it lots of times. Whenever I see anything royally beautiful, but... They shouldn't call that lovely place the Avenue. There's no meaning in a name like that. They should call it, let me see, the White Way of Delight. Isn't that a nice and imaginative name? When I don't like the name of a place or a person, I always think of a new one, and I always think of them so. There was a girl at the asylum whose name was Hepzibah Jenkins, but I always imagined her as Rosalia Devere. Other people may call that place the Avenue, but I shall always call it the White Way of Delight. Have we really got only another mile to go to get home? I'm glad and I'm sorry. I'm sorry because this drive has been so pleasant, and I'm always sorry when pleasant things end. Something still pleasanter may come after, but you can never be sure. And it's so often the case that it isn't pleasanter. That's been my experience, anyhow. But I'm glad to think of getting home. See, I've never really had a real home since I can remember. It gives me that pleasant ache again just to think of coming to a really, truly home. Oh, isn't that pretty? They'd just driven over the crest of a hill. Below them was a pond, looking almost like a river, so long and winding it was. A bridge spanned it midway, and from there to its lower end, where an amber-hued belt of sandhills shut it in from the dark blue gulf beyond, the water was a glory of many shifting hues, the most spiritual shadings of crocus and rose and ethereal green, with other elusive tintings for which no name has ever been found. Above the bridge, the pond ran up into the fringing groves of fir and maple, and lay all darkly translucent in their wavering shadows. Here and there, a wild plum leaned out from the bank, like a white-clad girl tiptoeing to her own reflection.
From the marsh at the head of the pond came the clear, mournfully sweet chorus of the frogs. There was a little gray house peering around a white apple orchard on a slope beyond, and although it was not yet quite dark, a light was shining from one of its windows. That's Barry's Pond, said Matthew. Oh, I don't like that name either. I shall call it, let me see, the Lake of Shining Waters. If that's the right name for it, I know because of the thrill. When I hit on a name that suits exactly, it gives me a thrill. Do things ever give you a thrill? Matthew ruminated. Well now? Yes, it always gives me a kind of thrill to see them ugly white grubs that's made up, spade up in the cucumber beds. I hate the look of them. Oh, I don't think that can be exactly the same kind of thrill. Do you think it can? There doesn't seem to be much connection between grubs and lakes of shining waters, does there? But why do other people call it Barry's Pond? I reckon because Mr. Barry lives up there in that house. Orchard Slope's the name of his place. If it weren't for that big bush behind it, you could see Green Gables from here. We got to go over the bridge and round by the road, so it's near half a mile further. Has Mr. Barry any little girls? Well, not so little either, about my size. He's got one about eleven. Her name's Diana. Ooh, with a long indrawing of breath, what a perfectly lovely name. Well, now, I don't know. There's something dreadful heathenish about it, seems to me. I'd rather Jane or Mary or some sensible name like that. When Diana was born, there was a schoolmaster borning there, and they gave him the naming of her, and he called her Diana. I wish there'd been a schoolmaster around like that when I was born, then. Oh, here we are at the bridge. I'm going to shut my eyes tight. I'm always afraid going over bridges. I can't help imagining that perhaps, just as we get to the middle, they'll crumple up like a jackknife and nip us so I shut my eyes, but I always have to open them for all when I can't think we're getting near the middle, because you see, if the bridge did crumple up, I want to see it crumple. What a jolly rumble it makes. I always like the rumbling part of it. Isn't it splendid? There are so many things to like in this world. There, we're over. Now I'll look back. Good night, dear lake of shining waters. I always say good night to things I love, just as I would to people. I think they like it. That water looks as if it were smiling at me. When they'd driven up the further hill and around a corner, Matthew said, Pretty near home now. That's Green Gables, over. Oh, don't tell me, she interrupted breathlessly, catching at his partially raised arm and shutting her eyes so that she might not see his gesture. Let me guess. I'm sure I'll guess right. She opened her eyes and looked about her. They were on the crest of a hill. The sun had set some time since, but the landscape was still clear in the mellow afterlight. To the west, a dark church spire rose up against a marigold sky. Below was a little valley, and beyond a long, gently rising slope, with snug farmsteads scattered along it. From one to another, the child's eyes darted, eager and wistful. At last they lingered on one away to the left, far back from the road, dimly white with blossoming trees in the twilight of the surrounding woods. Over it, in the stainless southwest sky, a great crystal white star was shining like a lamp of guidance and promise. That's it, isn't it? She said, pointing. Matthew slapped the reins on the sorrel's back delightedly. Well, now you guessed it, but I reckon Mrs. Spencer described it so you could tell. No, she didn't. Really, she didn't. All she said might just as well have been about most of those other places. I hadn't any real idea what it looked like, but just as soon as I saw it, I felt it was home. Oh, it seems as if I must be in a dream. Do you know my arm must be black and blue from the elbow up, for I pinched myself so many times today. Every little while a horrible, sickening feeling would come over me and be so afraid it was all a dream, and I pinched myself to see if it was real, until suddenly I remembered that even supposing it was only a dream, I better go on dreaming as long as I could. So I stopped pinching, but it is real, and we're nearly home. With a sigh of rapture, she relapsed into silence. Matthew stirred uneasily. He felt glad it would be Marilla, and not he would have to tell this waif of the world that the home she longed for was not to be hers after all. They drove over Lynn's Hollow, where it was already quite dark, but not so dark that Mrs. Rachel could not see them from her window vantage, and up the hill and into the long lane of green gables, and by the time they arrived at the house, Matthew was shrinking from the approaching revelation with an energy he did not understand. It was not of Marilla or himself he was thinking, or of the trouble this mistake was probably going to make for them.
but of the child's disappointment. When he thought of that rapt light being quenched in her eyes, he had an uncomfortable feeling that he was going to assist at murdering something, much the same feeling that came over him when he had to kill a lamb or a calf or any other innocent little creature. The yard was quite dark as they turned into it, and the poplar leaves were rustling silkily all around. Listen to the trees talking in their sleep, she whispered as he lifted her to the ground. What nice dreams they must have. Then, holding tightly to the carpet bag, which contained all her worldly goods, she followed him into the house. Chapter 3. Marilla Cuthbert is Surprised Marilla came briskly forward as Matthew opened the door, but when her eyes fell on the odd little figure in the stiff, ugly dress with the long braids of red hair and the eager, luminous eyes, she stopped short in amazement. Matthew Cuthbert, who's that? she ejaculated. Where's the boy? There wasn't any boy, said Matthew wretchedly. There is only her. He nodded at the child, remembering that he'd never even asked her name. No boy! But there must have been a boy, insisted Marilla. We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring a boy. Well, she didn't. She brought her. I asked the station master. And I had to bring her home. She couldn't be left there, no matter where the mistake had come in. Well, that's a pretty piece of business, ejaculated Marilla. During this dialogue, the child had remained silent, her eyes roving from one to the other, all the animation fading out of her face. Suddenly, she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what had been said. Dropping her precious carpet bag, she sprang forward a step and clasped her hands. You don't want me, she cried. You don't want me because I'm not a boy. I might have expected it. Nobody ever did want me. I might have known it was all too beautiful to last. I might have known nobody really did want me. But what shall I do? I'm going to burst into tears. Burst into tears, she did sitting down on the chair by the table, flinging her arms out upon it and burying her face in them. She proceeded to cry stormily. Marilla and Matthew looked at each other deprecatingly across the stove. Neither of them knew what to say or do. Finally, Marilla stepped lamely into the breach. Well, well, there is no need to cry so about it. Yes, there is need, the child raised her head quickly, revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. You would cry too if you were an orphan and come to a place you thought was going to be home and found that they didn't want you because you weren't a boy. This is the most tragical thing that's ever happened to me. Something like a reluctant smile, rather l rusty from long disused, mellowed Marilla's grim expression. Well, don't cry anymore. We're not going to turn you out of doors tonight. You'll have to stay here until we investigate this affair. What's your name? The child hesitated for a moment. Will you please call me Cordelia, she said eagerly. Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? No, it's not exactly my name, but I'd love to be called Cordelia. It's such a perfectly elegant name. I don't know what on earth you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is? And surely, reluctantly faltered forth the owner of that name. But oh, please do call me Cordelia. It can't matter much to you what you call me if I'm only going to be here a little while, can it? And Anne is such an unromantic name. Unromantic fiddlesticks, said the unsympathetic Marilla. Anne is a real good, plain, sensible name. You've no need to be ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of it, exclaimed Anne. Only I like Cordelia better. I've always imagined my name was Cordelia. At least, I always have of late years. When I was young, I used to imagine it was Geraldine. But I like Cordelia better now. But if you call me Anne, please call me Anne spelled with an E. What difference does it make how it's spelled? Asked Marilla with another rusty smile as she picked up the teapot. Oh, it makes such a difference. It looks so much nicer. When you hear a name pronounced, can't you always see it in your mind, just as if it was printed out? I can. And A-N-N -N looks dreadful, but A-N-N-E looks so much more distinguished. If you only call me N spelled with an E, I shall try to reconcile myself to not being called Cordelia. Very well, then, Anne spelled with an E. Can you tell us how this mistake came to be made? We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring us a boy. Were there no boys at the asylum? Oh, yes, there was an abundance of them. But Mrs. Spencer said distinctly that you wanted a girl about 11 years old, and the matron said she thought I would do. You don't know how delighted I was. I couldn't sleep all last night for joy. <laughs> 
Oh, she added reproachfully, turning to Matthew, why didn't you tell me at the station that you didn't want me and leave me there? If I hadn't seen the white wave delight in the lake of shining waters, it wouldn't be so hard. What on earth does she mean? demanded Marilla, staring at Matthew. Shh, she's just referring to some conversation we had on the road, said Matthew hastily. I'm going out to put the mare in, Marilla. Have tea ready when I come back. Did Mrs. Spencer bring anybody over besides you, continued Marilla, when Matthew had gone out. She brought Lily Jones for herself. Lily's only five years old, and she's very beautiful. She has nut-brown hair. If I was very beautiful and had nut-brown hair, would you keep me? No, we want a boy to help Matthew on the farm. A girl would be of no use to us. Take off your hat. I'll lay it in your bag on the hall table. Anne took off her hat meekly. Matthew came back presently, and they sat down to supper, but Anne could not eat. In vain she nibbled at the bread and butter, and pecked at the crab-apple preserve out of a little scalloped glass dish by her plate. She did not really make any headway at all. "'You're not eating anything,' said Marilla sharply, eyeing her as if this were a serious shortcoming. Anne sighed. "'I can't. I'm in the depths of despair. Can you eat when you're in the depths of despair?' I've never been in the depths of despair, so I can't say, responded Marilla. Weren't you? Well, did you ever try to imagine you were in the depths of despair? No, I didn't. And I don't think you can understand what it's like. It's a very uncomfortable feeling indeed. When you try to eat a lump, it comes right up into your throat, and you can't swallow anything, not even if it was a chocolate caramel. I had one chocolate caramel once two years ago, and it was simply delicious. I've often dreamed since then that I had a lot of chocolate caramels, but I always wake up just when I'm going to eat them. I do hope you won't be offended because I can't eat. Everything is extremely nice, but I still cannot eat. I guess she's tired, said Matthew, who hadn't spoken since his return from the barn. Vespered her bed, Marilla. Marilla had been wondering where Anne should be put to bed. She prepared a couch in the kitchen chamber for the desired and expected boy. But although it was neat and clean, it did not seem quite the thing to put a girl there somehow. The spare room was out of question for such a stray waif, so there remained only the east gable room. Marilla lighted a candle and told Anne to follow her, which Anne spiritlessly did, taking her hat and carpet bag from the hall table as she passed. The hall was fearsomely clean. The little gable chamber in which she presently found herself seemed still cleaner. Marilla set the candle on a three-legged, three-cornered table and turned down the bedclothes. I suppose you have a nightgown, she questioned. Anne nodded. Yes, I have two. The matron of the asylum made them for me. They're fearfully skimpy. There's never enough to go around in an asylum, so things were always skimpy, at least in a poor asylum like ours. I hate skimpy night dresses, but one can dream just as well in them as in lovely trailing ones with frills round the neck. That's one consolation. Well, undress as quick as you can and go to bed. I'll come back in a few minutes for the candle. I daren't trust you to put it out yourself. You're likely to set the place on fire. When Marilla had gone, Anne looked around her wistfully. The whitewashed walls were so painfully bare and staring that she thought they must ache over their own bareness. The floor was bare too, except for a round braided mat in the middle, such as Anne had never seen before. In one corner was the bed, a high old-fashioned one with four dark, low-turned posts. In the other corner was the aforesaid three-cornered table, adorned with a fat red velvet pincushion hard enough to turn the point to the most adventurous pin. Above it hung a little six-by-eight mirror. Midway between the table and the bed was the window, with an icy white muslin frill over it, and opposite it was the washstand. The whole apartment was of a rigidity not to be described in words, but which sent a shiver to the very marrow of Anne's bones. With a sob, she hastily discarded her garments, put on the skimpy nightgown, and sprang into bed, where she burrowed face down into the pillow and pulled the clothes over her head. When Marilla came up for the light, various skimpy articles of raiment scattered most untidily over the floor, and a certain tempestuous arrangement to the bed were the only indications of any presence save her own. She deliberately picked up Anne's clothes, placed them neatly on a prim yellow chair, and then, taking up the candle, went over to the bed. Good night, she said a little awkwardly, but not unkindly. Anne's white face and big eyes appeared over the bedclothes with a startling suddenness. How can it be a good night when you know it must be the worst night I've ever had? She said reproachfully, Then she dived down into invisibility again.
Marilla went slowly down to the kitchen and proceeded to wash the supper dishes. Matthew was smoking, a sure sign of perturbation of mind. He seldom smoked, for Marilla set her face against it as a filthy habit, but at certain times and seasons he felt driven to it, and then Marilla winked at the practice, realizing that a mere man must have some vent for his emotions. Well, this is a pretty kettle of fish, she said wrathfully. This is what comes of sending word instead of going ourselves. Robert Spencer folks have twisted that message somehow. One of us will have to drive over and see Mrs. Spencer tomorrow, that's certain. This girl will have to be sent back to the asylum. Yes, I suppose so, said Matthew reluctantly. You suppose so. Don't you know it? Well, now, she's a real nice little thing, Marilla. It's kind of a pity to send her back when she's so set on staying here. Matthew Cuthbert, you don't mean to say you think we ought to keep her? Marilla's astonishment could not have been greater if Matthew had expressed a predilection for standing on his head. Well, now, no, I suppose not, not exactly, stammered Matthew, uncomfortably driven into a corner for his precise meaning. I suppose we could hardly be expected to keep her. I should say not. What good would she be to us? We might be some good to her, said Matthew suddenly and unexpectedly. Matthew Cuthbert, I believe that child has bewitched you. I can see it as plain as plain that you want to keep her. Well, now... She's a real interesting little thing, persisted Matthew. You should have heard her talk coming from the station. Oh, she can talk fast enough. I saw that at once. It's nothing in her favor, either. I don't like children who have so much to say. I don't want an orphan girl, and if she, if I did, she isn't the style I'd pick out. Something I don't understand about her. No, she's got to be dispatched straight away, back to where she came from. I could hire a French boy to help me, said Matthew she'd be company for you. I'm not suffering for company, said Marilla shortly, and I'm not going to keep her. Well, now, it's just as you say, of course, Marilla, said Matthew, rising and putting his pipe away. I'm going to bed. To bed went Matthew, and to bed, when she had put her dishes away, went Marilla, frowning most resolutely, and upstairs in the east gable, a lonely, heart-hungry, friendless child, cried herself to sleep. Now, before I close out for the day, I just want to say a few things. If you haven't noticed, it's pretty hard for me to read that book without it tugging at my heartstrings like crazy. I deeply love that book. I grew up with the um, Emmy Award winning TV series. If you have not watched this, this is one of the greatest TV series ever made, in my opinion. I used to watch it when I was a kid with my sister. Um, I still love it. I uh, showed it to my little girls. They loved it. There's no other adaptation you should be looking at. Um, some of the newer adaptations, uh, they don't capture the spirit in the same way. This adaptation is just like reading the book. And I have to say, part of it is the power of the casting. The casting in this is absolutely fantastic. Marilla, Matthew, Anne, um, <clears throat> All of the minor characters, Diana, like they are those characters to me. Partly that's because I grew up with them, but going back and uh, reviewing the performance, they're spectacular, particularly Marilla. I always, ever since I was a kid, just loved, um, loved Marilla. And Anne's the sort of character who could be very twee and very annoying, but she has to have this charm and spirit to her and she is meant to be a little annoying to the characters but also completely lovable and i have to say my older daughter is very much an Anne. she was born just like this super dramatic super talkative super full of passion and feelings and so uh, in my own life this ended up becoming a kind of prophecy for me that i ended up with a with a kind of an Anne girl in my own house um, and i've got quite a tender soft spot for her I, I also have to say, I kind of have a soft spot for um, tough, or tough minded old battle axes, people like Marilla. Uh, there's so many uh, English literature books that contain these tough old battle axe women, and, and I just love them. I adore them. I've always adored them. And Marilla is absolutely one of my favorites of all time. It's wonderful to see how she unfolds and changes. 
I've also done some readings of Pollyanna. Pollyanna is a somewhat similar story, of course. You can see the connection, why I love both of those stories so much, why both of them just wrench at me so much. They really pull the feelings out of me. I myself am someone who's um, maybe can sometimes be a bit of a Matthew on the outside. Depends on what time in my life you've known me and in what context. But on the inside, uh, I've always been very much a bit of an Anne myself very full of imagination, very full of romantic imaginings, lots of passion, lots of feeling. So I find Anne to just be a delightfully charming uh, character. She's just so incredibly lovable. The setting, the small town, it's wonderful, it's beautiful. Um, it's hard to beat. And uh, as I said, this is a perfect adaptation of it. Um, and the book, of course, is, is a wonderful adaptation. Anne of Green Gables is a much... Uh, longer book than Pollyanna, and while I hope to cover Pollyanna in full eventually, it might be a bit more of a challenge to cover uh, Anne of Green Gables, so it's a much longer book. So hopefully you'll take this section and uh, go read the rest of it yourself, and uh, I'll also try to come back to it again when I have some time. So thanks for listening. See you next time.